You're listening to Impulse to Innovation. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Mees. As a global community of mechanical engineers with over 120,000 members in 140 countries, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers has been at the heart of the engineering profession since 1847. The Institution's mission is to improve the world through engineering by sharing the latest news, views and insight into the creative world of technology and the people that make it happen. In this month's episode, we're focusing on energy and sustainability and how the ongoing global pandemic is changing the way people think about energy use and sustainable resources and materials. I had an in-depth chat with two entrepreneurial women in the energy sector. Both are IMECI members and recently winners of the Women's Engineering Society Top 50 Women in Energy. We'll hear their thoughts on the subject later. And Carly Nettleford, one of the institution's policy officers, will be giving us an update on the Low Carbon Local Energy Report one year on from its publication and whether anything has changed in the interim. But first, let's take a look at what's happening globally in the energy sector. The effects of climate change and the growing movement towards sustainable energy and materials use has been high on society's agenda in recent years. Nevertheless, The pandemic is expected to cause the largest reduction in annual CO2 emissions ever recorded, with factories shut down and mobility greatly reduced. The International Energy Agency expects global emissions to fall around 8% this year due to COVID, but also notes that the recovery from the 2008 financial crisis was accompanied by one of the largest increases in emissions ever recorded. 2020 was due to see a global round of climate and energy initiatives and strategies as part of the Paris Agreement, followed by a review of progress at the annual COP26 UN Climate Talks. But 2020 hasn't quite been the year we expected, has it? The World Economic Forum believes that our relationship with nature is broken, but the pandemic has demonstrated that as a global community, we are capable of rapid change at great speed and scale. They believe that if we focus not just on energy consumption, but on sustainable processes, for example, the way we grow our food and use the land and oceans, we will be closer to a sustainable society, a nature positive economy, as they describe it. According to the WEF, embracing this idea has the potential to generate $3 trillion of additional business opportunities each year and create 177 million jobs by 2030. One particular area ripe for such changes is the manufacturing industry, where transitioning to a circular economy of material and energy use could save the automotive industry $870 billion over the next 10 years. On the flip side, the pandemic could cause a fall of up to 30% in construction activity this year, devastating a sector that employs nearly a tenth of the global workforce. However, the WEF thinks that retrofitting existing building stock and constructing more efficient new buildings could create between 9 and 30 jobs for every million dollars invested over the coming years. Interestingly, a recent survey by Schneider Electric across a number of industries has shown that 60% of respondents were considering on-site or off-site renewables as a purchasing strategy in the next three years to manage their energy needs. And the number of corporates deploying technologies such as smart meters, sensors and other smart assets has doubled between 2019 and 2020. There are a lot of good news stories when it comes to renewable energy, but there is a long way to go before we are living in a renewable energy world. Research carried out by scientists at Stanford University have predicted that the world could be run completely on renewable energy in the next 20 to 40 years, which is an amazing thought. But while renewables were the largest source of new energy in 2019, there were still record highs of oil, gas and CO2 emissions, according to new global data from oil giant BP. In their annual statistical review of world energy, global primary energy demand reached a new high in 2019 of 584 exajoules, up by 1.3% a year earlier. Three quarters of the increase came from China, 
Overall, that means that global energy demand grew by the equivalent of the UK or Mexico in total. Some 41% of the increase in 2019 was met by renewables, about 3.2 exajoules, including wind, solar and biomass. Large hydro met about 4% of the increase in new demand and another 10% came from nuclear, meaning low-cost carbon sources met 55% of the total. So which countries are leading the way on sustainable energy use? Iceland is well known as being the world's leader in renewable energy generation and produces more electricity per person than any other country on Earth. Nearly 100% of their energy comes from renewable sources, thanks to the unique Icelandic landscape. Iceland generates hydropower and geothermal energy, which produces around 95% of the country's heating. Norway comes in a close second, producing 98% of its energy from renewable sources. But African nations, such as Kenya and Nigeria, are making a concerted effort to drive renewable use, with Kenya currently producing 70% of energy from renewable sources, its aim to be 100% powered by green energy in 2020. Nigeria too has announced a post-coronavirus economic plan called Bouncing Back, which includes a focus on expanding the nation's solar infrastructure. Uruguay has managed to significantly reduce its carbon footprint without government subsidies and without an increase in consumer costs. This has been achieved through a positive governmental regulatory environment, which encourages the public and private sector to work together. In the UK, of course, wind power is the main contributor to renewable energy production – Currently, Scotland is able to produce enough renewable energy to power all its homes and businesses without the need of any fossil fuels. The UK now produces more energy from wind farms than it does from coal, and its plan for a post-Covid recovery, which was announced by the government in two speeches at the end of June and early July, will provide over £30 billion towards renewable energy and has earmarked £3 billion for climate action. The USA, however has one of the lowest uptakes of renewables, with just 18% of energy coming from these sources. And this could fall even further. In the country's 2020 budget, the renewable energy budget fell by $700 million, a significant drop from figures as high as $2.3 billion in previous years. Many environmental and economic organisations believe the world is in a far better position today to recover sustainably than ever before, as renewable technologies are far cheaper than they were even a decade ago. The IEA believes that support for innovation and new clean technologies could have long-term benefits, with much of the change to sustainable practices by big business and industry due in part to public perception. Many customers are now putting sustainable practices before brand identity when they purchase goods and services. The IEA has recommended that $45 billion should be set aside each year for the acceleration of a selection of technologies, including hydrogen, batteries, carbon capture, utilisation and storage, and small modular nuclear reactors. So what kind of initiatives are going on both locally and internationally? Well, there's good news in the UK. The Earthworks Trust, an environmental education charity uh, based in Hampshire, is leading by example despite the pandemic and has pressed ahead with an ambitious £1.25 million eco-refurbishment of a derelict building uh, on their estate. The refurbishment project is a great exemplar, with the building being heated by a ground source heat pump with a borehole array totalling over a kilometre in length and 100 metres square of solar cells on the south, east and west slopes of its newly pitched roof will generate clean electricity for the whole site. And continuing with the eco-building theme, civil engineering students from the University of the Philippines have invented an alternative to regular concrete made from recycled materials such as ash and waste glass. This has been combined with common types of rock which has been found around the university's campus. The student research team hopes the eco-concrete could replace gravel and cement as a building material in the local community. 
And it's not just in the construction industry where innovation is being found. JCB were this year's winners of the McRobert Award from the Royal Academy of Engineering for their 19C-1E excavator. It's the world's first volume-produced fully electric digger. And to date, the current fleet has reportedly saved the equivalent of 15,000 kilograms in CO2 emissions across 5,616 hours of work. It's estimated that if used across the global construction sector, which contributes to 39% of all carbon emissions, these savings could reach billions of tonnes. And another innovation to have hit the headlines in the last month comes from Dutch university KU Leuven, where engineers have successfully developed a solar panel that can capture light energy and moisture in the air to create hydrogen. The device, unveiled after 10 years of research, uses photovoltaic panels to capture light energy and zirconium and acid structures to trap water vapour. The energy and water are then combined in a box below the panel where a controlled chemical reaction is initiated and hydrogen is produced. 15% of the sunlight captured in the panel goes straight into this reaction and the rest is being used to generate electricity. The engineering research team behind the technology claim that one 1.62 metre panel can produce up to 250 litres of hydrogen daily, ready for use in low carbon heating and transport applications. Another innovation which covers two of my favourite things, obviously one being sustainability, the other being a nice cold beer, has been unveiled this month by a Dutch company. It's created a new washing up liquid made using wastewater and ethanol from non-alcoholic beer making processes. Non-alcoholic beer is made the same way as regular beer, with yeast used to convert sugar from barley into ethanol. But in this case, the ethanol is extracted through filtering and then is mixed with the spent water to create the washing up liquid. Each bottle of this innovative washing up liquid contains at least 25% of brewery byproducts. The liquid is then put into bottles that are 100% recyclable. The manufacturers are hoping to have this available on the shelves by September of this year. And I'm hopeful that it might encourage my husband to do the washing up a little bit more often. And finally, fast food company McDonald's is not necessarily an organisation you associate with energy sustainability, but its West Buena Vista Drive restaurant in Florida is getting a lot of attention, not just because it is right on the side of Disney World, but because it now runs completely on renewable energy. Its roof is fitted with solar panels, its outdoor dining space is fitted with solar panel awnings, passive ventilation and a living garden wall that naturally cools the space. Customers are encouraged to burn off a few burgers by going a few rounds on the solar bikes that will help generate power for the building. McDonald's say they are using this restaurant as a learning hub with plans to analyse the data from the location as part of an overall effort to decrease its energy usage and carbon footprint company-wide in the years to come. Here at Impulse to Innovation, we would love to hear from you, our listeners, about some of the innovative ideas and thoughts that you have on energy and energy sustainability. If you want to get in touch with us, then you can drop us an email at podcast at imakey.org. That's podcast at imakey.org. You can find the details in the podcast notes. Doctors Laura Bishop and Kerry Mashford are both members of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. I had an opportunity to interview them recently and ask them for their views on the energy sustainability sector. Well, good morning. And um, it is, it's quite an early morning, isn't it, ladies? Uh, <laughs> we're, we, we've... Uh, We've got on the on the uh, podcast today two amazing ladies uh, who are both members of the IMACI, um, and I'm very privileged to know both of them. Laura, Kerry, welcome to our IMACI podcast. Thank, um, thank you. It's really nice to have you on. Could you just start uh, really by giving us a list, uh, our listeners uh, an idea of who you are and, and what you do? Uh, Laura, could we start with you? Yes, that's fine. Okay, well, thanks for uh, inviting me, Helen. And it's really exciting to be the first of, you know, the two first ones on the podcast. Um, so I'm Laura Bishop and um, I'm a chartered mechanical engineer as a member of the IMECI. 
as you've just said. And uh, I run a uh, renewable heat consultancy in Derby. Um, so I spent, um, I, I went to university in Wolverhampton and then spent uh, 14 years working in the corporate world, um, including places like Rolls Royce and Babcock, where we met Helen. Absolutely. And then, <laughs> and then latterly with Eon, where I was. Um, engineering manager for um, re- uh, microgeneration projects and uh, com- the commercial heat business. So that was looking at um, big heat pumps and big biomass. And basically, I took redundancy from there and set up my own consultancy six years ago just to see basically whether I could make it work or not as a self-employed person. Uh, and then six years later, here I am still doing that. So um Basically, it's the same as, well, similar to what I was doing at Eon. It's uh, developing um, renewable heat projects, mainly big ground source, water source heat pumps, um, with and without district heat networks um, and cooling networks as well. Um, I'm also a member of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association Council, um, and we've been doing some webinars actually recently on trying to encourage people um, and explain a bit about the heat pump industry, what heat pumps are, um, how they work, how to make them work properly. And so that's my mission really, I suppose, in life is to get people off gas and oil and get them using a different kind of um, heating system that doesn't um, pollute and uh, cause carbon emissions. So that's me. That sounds like a great cause. Thanks, Laura. Um, Kerry? Goodness, how to follow that? Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Helen, for inviting me onto this. It's really, as Laura said, it's a it's a real honour to be part of the the the, pre- the, um, uh, the first uh, podcast. So that's fantastic. Um, uh, I've had, I guess, probably a considerably longer career than, than Laura has. I, I'm getting on a bit in years, uh, but I've been um, uh, involved in sustainability. Uh, almost from the from the outset, I started my career in um, utilities and uh, 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 energy generation and the like. Then uh, spent some time in manufacturing industry, but eleven years with Unilever, um, working on uh, more sustainable processes and systems um, to reduce waste, improve resource manufacturing, and such like. So though that was that my time mostly at, at Unley, which was really exciting. I, I moved on from there to, first of all, to look at um, the uh, future of manufacturing through the Foresight program. And I was seconded to the DTI then to run the Foresight Manufacturing uh, 2020 program, which was really, again, really exciting. Looking you know, that far ahead uh, really, really sort of brought home to me the need for us to, as a as a global society, to be more sustainable, and and really the very powerful role that engineers could play in that. So pretty much since then, and in fact before then, to a large extent, I've been more and more involved in um, resource efficiency, and then increasingly in uh, the energy efficiency side. And energy in buildings is a big one. Uh, manufacturing uh, it came into buildings, particularly in terms of offsite manufacturing. So energy in buildings, the energy performance of buildings, and um, until a couple of years ago, I spent um, five years, uh, five, just over five years, as the chief exec of the National Energy Foundation, which was a charity involved in energy in buildings. And actually, uh, it launched and ran for many years the Ground Source Heat Pump Association. So we've got a connection there, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't right. think we either of us knew about. But anyway, no. <laughs> so the Ground Source Heat Pump Association um, went. Uh, you know, went, uh, we we started the solar uh, power one, and then the Ground Source Heat Pump one, and basically, sort of as an embryonic organisation. And then um, when when they were flourishing, they went off and, and did their own thing. So more recently, very recently, I've been involved more on the policy and strategy side, I think, to a large extent. I do have a voluntary role as a a director of the Southeast Midlands Local Enterprise Partnership, where I'm also the energy uh, champion for that uh, that left area. And it's, uh, it's very much focused. My role really there well as being a normal director is to uh, is to, to to try and inject the net zero transition and, and energy efficiency and energy improvements both into the economic activity in the area but also into um, uh, everything else that's happening to make sure it it uh, pervades all activities and it's a consideration across the piece um, I'm also a non-exec director of the active building center 
um, which is a, an RTO um, involved in transforming construction by making buildings uh, energy positive. Um, I'm a director of the Ecology Building Society, uh, where I'm trying to um, help improve the financing of more energy efficient and energy positive buildings. Um, and uh, on the IMEC, in the IMEC, uh, at the moment, I'm actually uh, chair of the implementation group that is trying to improve the whole uh, governance and uh, financial management of the uh, the institution, including a lot to do with making it more open and transparent and uh, inclusive. Um, and that's a really exciting, if albeit challenging, role. So the key thing there is to make it all fit for the future. So that's probably in, oh, enough about, pretty much enough about me, except that I have built several um, self, uh, self-built self houses for myself over and um, on my family uh, with my husband over the years, all of which have been pushing the boundaries of, um, of, of um, uh, sustainable sustainable buildings and energy systems. Kerry, um, I am utterly flabbergasted. I mean, <laughs> you know, this this is why I see you have an OBE. Um, so <laughs> that is an amazing... Yeah, yeah, you forgot about that. Oh, well, never mind. Um, just, just one of those things. It's, that is just an amazing CV, if ever I heard one. Um, so I, I'm, I guess congratulating both of you for becoming... Where's uh, top fifty women in energy is kind of just another another accolade, really, in some respects for both of you. You you both had an amazing uh, career so far. So how how beneficial is it to be recognised um, as as top fifty women in in the industry? You know, d- does it um, does it have an influence? Do you think in in the, what you're doing? Um, you know, and and uh, and how you progress not just your career, but, but obviously the issues surrounding sustainability. Um, and, I think, um, yeah, I think that's the main thing. I mean, it, it, obviously it's a great honour and it's good um, to, to really to um, strengthen the network that, that we've got. We, I, I know some of the people who are on that, on that list, but others I don't know or don't know very well. And, and there's a sense of, um, of common purpose in there, which, which is really helpful. And I think we, you know, we're still trying to push the boundaries with all of this. And it's great to have sort of other people who have, who've got the energy as well to, to do that. But more than that, I think it, it does bring uh, all of us are doing things that we believe in because we believe in them. And uh, the, uh, the organisations we're associated with, it helps us to get greater recognition for our causes in those organisations. But also if those organisations are themselves uh, promoting these causes, then, then it ha- it helps them in the wider world to uh, to raise their profile. So that's that's why I, I'm really pleased about it from my point of view. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, Laura. I mean, what does it mean to you in terms of your business? Yeah, I, th- I think that you know, there's there's obviously that is a really big thing. I hadn't actually thought about that before, Kerry. About you know, sort of bringing together there's 50 women there all pursuing the sustainability you know um, thread and. Uh, getting to know them and, and also finding out the people that you knew who, who you didn't actually realise were on there has been very useful and it is a really good network to have. Um, I think the other thing for me is um, it's obviously um, reinforcing the, the the message that we're, we're doing the right thing, if you know what I mean. Um, it's It sort of shows people that it's almost like um, confirmation of what we're doing, really. I suppose um, to be a, to be recognised like that, and obviously it's good for clients um, to know that they've got somebody who's who's been um, recognised in that way to be working on their projects. But for me, the most important thing about it is sort of showing young girls um, and other women in the industry that they can do this. And I, I, <clears throat> I've said this before. I'm not a feminist in any way. Um, I think you know that, Helen. Um, but um, <laughs> if another girl can look at us and go, okay, there's 50 women there. They all look quite normal. <laughs> um, and they've, here they are working in the engineering industry, being recognised for what they're doing. I could do that. That's that for me. If that inspires one yeah. of the young girl to think I can go into engineering and I can do that, that is that has been a success, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I th- I think that's uh, that's a great way to think about it, Laura. Yeah, um, just thinking about um, 
Laura, some of the things that that you've done, you've worked in in a number of of renewable energy systems over the years, as you've mentioned, PV design for local housing, large scale ground source heat pumps and so on. Um, What do you see as being sort of fundamental to creating uh, sustainable systems in in the local community? And you've touched on that in in terms of, of the WES uh, award, but what do you feel is, is are going to be the most important things to to help drive local communities to engage with sustainable energy? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so I think up till now, or up to very recently, when you talk to people about renewable energy, they instantly think renewable electricity. So they instantly think solar PV and wind turbines. That is what they think, and there's still a big group of you know, still part of society that still thinks that to be renewable and to be sustainable, you need solar PV on your roof. In actual fact, more emissions for the the UK come from heating our homes and, and buildings. So tackling gas use and gas boilers in homes is a huge area that we need to address. And the government had, you know, back in 2011, the Renewable Heat Incentive was launched with the sole purpose of encouraging people to take up renewable heat options. So whether that's air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, more solar thermal, um, biomass boilers, anything like that, that was that was the purpose of that. Now we're coming towards the end of that scheme that finishes in March 2022 and the government have got re- legislation in place for 2025 onwards where you won't be able to put gas boilers into new buildings anymore, into new build houses anymore. Um, there's still a big gap though, in my opinion, for... Um, commercial buildings, offices, um, uh, schools, leisure centres, places like that, where uh, taking them off gas, taking off oil. In some cases, people are still burning coal in some of their um, in, in commercial buildings. Um, there's a gap there that we need to fill. And also it's getting the message out to people in the local area that the house they live in, where they've got their gas boiler ticking away nicely in the background. And how do you get to those people and say, right, take your gas boiler out, put an air source heat pump in, put a ground source heat pump in, put a communal ground source heat pump in, that, that you know, on a, on a low temperature ambient loop. How you get that message out is really important. And I think incentives help because if people know they're going to get some money back for what they're doing, that's a, definitely a driver. But I think educating your neighbours <laughs> And, and the people in your community. And certainly it's got to come from councils as well, um, uh, you know, putting some pressure on planning and things like that. So that's where I think the big hit has got to come, which is decarbonising the heat that we generate in our homes and businesses. Yeah, that, I think that's a good point, Laura. And I think that leads um, on to, um, to a point I was going to ask Kerry, which um, obviously you've had a very extensive career in improving the performance of buildings to ensure that they're more energy efficient. Do you think, Kerry, post-COVID that companies should be thinking much more about their energy use, particularly if um, more of their staff are going to be working from home or they're not spending as much time in large office spaces? Uh, As Laura's pointed out, you know, working with a local community will be good, but you've got to address some of the bigger organisations, the local organisations that perhaps need to think about their energy use. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I could talk about this for days, not only hours. I mean, it's it's an enormous, uh, enormous issue. And I mean, just building on what what Laura has said so far, the best thing to do is to not use as much energy. And and most of the work around building performance um, involves not only uh, improving the energy use of the bu- energy performance of, of a building, but also improving its um, uh, its environmental performance, its health benefits, and such like. So actually getting that kind of thing really moving forwards is it, it, it takes the strain off the uh, the the energy networks um, it maybe gives a little bit of um, a, a breathing space to find and, and deploy better solutions um, you know I've been looking at things where you're basically trading off retrofits of buildings and new buildings so you build new you know new buildings really really energy efficiently energy efficiently and then you also retrofit existing buildings alongside them that uh, helps to improve community cohesion as well because they're not they're not sort of different sides of the track you haven't got the old and the new um, so that that's helpful um, and and there are various um, uh, carbon uh, credit type um, systems that are in place that along 
uh, around some some councils that can help to to do that, taking some kind of um, levy almost, and then and then redeploying it in uh, in, in to retrofit buildings. And we at the National Energy Foundation we manage some of those uh, project projects and programs, and um, you know, provided evidence into, for example, the London um, GLA in terms of looking how they could roll out some of those things. So the, the key thing really is to improve the performance of the buildings in the first place. Um, obviously, that's more difficult for existing buildings, but anything that sort of involves re- removing VAT on refurbishments, all of that kind of thing, is sends the right signals. The other aspect of that is that um, thinking about when people make decisions in um, around buildings, and it's often when they either move house or to some extent when they might uh, retire and then they might have a little bit more time, a little bit more interest, want to make their built their home future-proof. So it's, it's capturing those kind of um, touch points that you can, where you can have some, some impact, some intervention there. Yeah. Um, and then the, the other key thing, really about all of this is looking at, as you've mentioned, about the commercial buildings and industrial buildings and, and non-domestic buildings. The um, uh, ESOS scheme, Energy Saving Opportunities Scheme, that all large larger companies need to um, engage with, which is an auditing system for their buildings on energy energy saving opportunities, um, not just their buildings, but their whole operations. But obviously, it focuses uh, to some extent on the buildings. And you can typically save between 15 and 20 percent of your energy with low or no cost measures. And it just needs skills and understanding to do that. So there is a huge role for engineers um, in in uh, evaluating and helping companies to identify those those opportunities Mo- and making the business case. Because the vast majority, for the vast majority of organizations, this isn't core business. So, A, we've got to really shine a light on it. And B, we've got to, help to find uh, and, and develop and, and make available um, very easy to use, um, sensible tools. And you can get a bit sort of anal about this and get too too deep into it. But the vast majority of, of organisations can make some really big improvements very quickly. And then the other thing that's that's really held things up a lot. Um, I don't know if Laura would agree with this. Is the is the uh, capability in the supply chain? Uh, I know, for example, on the ground source heat pump front, you can you know getting one installed is one thing. And that's not completely straightforward, although there are companies that do it very well. Trying to get it, things maintained, I mean, this is a few years ago, but trying to get things maintained is actually quite difficult. And I have a, a log-burning furnace in my home. Uh, if anything goes wrong with it, it's it's only because at the moment we are technically capable in our household right. <laughs> to do something about it, that, we're, that, that, we're, that, that, that we can manage it. But there are some real sort of market failures in this area, as well as it being um, a kind of a policy push yeah and I, I, I think Kerry that's just so important I mean we had a heat pump association council meeting on Wednesday one of the main area that we spent most time on talking about was training and that's uh, and, and also I've been speaking to somebody else this morning about the lack of engineers to design to install to maintain to operate to control any of these systems uh, to develop develop the projects out so the Grand Central Heat Pump Association we're now taking it upon ourselves to write our own training material and give it to the people who are either teaching in schools and universities or training people through SIPC or through MCS um, because it's the, the the opportunity is huge, but the number of people available to do it is so small. And that in the UK, there's only five ground loop qualified ground loop designers in the whole of the UK. Well, Laura, you've 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 really touched on a, a point there that I was going to ask because, um, you know, should we be creating more opportunities for people to come into the sector, particularly in sort of resource management? But, but you know, jobs, training, skills, you've both touched on on them very specifically. Um, you know, this this is not just bringing more engineers into the sector, but but making society more aware of it. Do you, do you think we should be creating more opportunities, Laura, for, for people in the sector? I think the opportunities are already there. What, 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 there seems to be a gap between the available people and the opportunities that are there. So um, the, the sort of renewable heating and the energy efficiency side of, of that whole business and that whole sector has been around for a long time, but people still see it as new and niche 
and it absolutely isn't it doesn't have to be um so you know there's there's a big piece of work that has got to be done for exposing the opportunities that are there explaining what they are it might be mechanical engineering it might be electrical engineering it might be project management it might be actual fitters on the ground going and uh, doing drilling or or um, plumbing and heat pumps or putting in um i don't know Kerry, but things like cavity wall insulation and you know all those sort of low cost but very easily done uh, energy efficiency measures that people don't think about um it's exposing them and then making them people aware of them and there's two things there people are looking for work at the moment do they fit into those opportunities if so please come and apply please come and have a chat with the businesses we might actually bite your arm off to, to you know <laughs> the right person. secondly it goes right back down to schools and you know kids coming out of you know infants juniors junior school explaining to them what an engineer does um, and it's not about wearing um overalls and working in a mechanics shop uh, because that is still uh, that is still there. That image is still prevalent. It's unbelievable. Um, but explaining to kids, uh, whether that's through assemblies, through doing lesson plans, through doing STEM work, I don't know. Um, there's a whole raft of things, but it is planting those ideas into kids' brains when they're very young and keeping it there as they grow up so that when they leave school, they can either go into apprenticeships or they can go and study at university and they're getting the right training, the right knowledge, something that is relevant for now. When I did my master's degree, I came out knowing all about wind turbines, but not a single thing about heat pumps. And that was only six years ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd just like to to, uh, come in on a couple of things because you've stimulated some thoughts uh, that that it's maybe worth worth sharing. I mean, the active building centre that I'm I'm now working with, uh, that's very much looking at the whole sort of um, end-to-end delivery process for all kinds of um, uh, active building uh, systems to understand where the barriers to um, mainstreaming, if I can call it that, exist. And some of those might be in the way contracts are, 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 are created and, uh, and written and deployed. Some might be in maintenance arrangements. Some would be in all the areas that you've described as well, Laura. So, yeah, there's loads of opportunities along that that whole route to make it to to get away from the barriers and the impediments and to sweep those away and to actually make it you know the new normal as we're afraid we're hearing quite a lot so i i, I think there's a lot of that going. the other point i would make about about the school side it's reminded uh, brought to mind a program that we started um exactly to address this kind of area uh, and to uh, to help um society overall become more energy literate um, when I was at the National Energy Foundation, we formed a relationship with the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, and we created we created something called um, Energy Entrepreneurs. Sorry, Energy en- Energy Envoys. Saying get the t- terminology right, uh, Energy Envoys, and that was a program that um, people signed up for the Duke of Edinburgh could do as their volunteering activity. Um, it was supported by energy information and project templates and various other things from the National Energy Foundation. And it enables them, uh, either individually or small groups, to do energy volunteering projects in their community. There were there was a whole range of things which were both intended to stimulate an interest in energy and the built environment, to create more energy literate adults and, and to make a, a, a practical contribution to the buildings um, in their communities. And we, we did, a, you know, being engineers, we did a kind of before and after measurement um, of, of some of these. And I think it's still going on since I since I left. But people were, you know, measurably more interested after they finished. They were far more literate after they finished. We had a sort of before and after tests and such like. You know, I think if we could get that kind of programme more heavily uh, supported and rolled out, because it did, you know, it did cost money to run it. And um, it's not something that's there forever. Uh, it happens on its own. But those kinds of things. Yeah, well, as as a Gold Duke of Edinburgh uh, award winner, I I can safely say that uh, it's it's definitely a scheme to do if if it's something that that's available to you. So that's fantastic. I wanted to kind of go on to a slightly more serious point, and and perhaps um, this could summarise I think um, our conversation today. Laura, if I might start with you, 
I know both of you have obviously been working in this field for a long time, and particularly I know Kerry has been involved in the sort of policy and strategy side, particularly on built environment. But Laura, if I might ask, you know, what really should government be doing now to encourage the use of renewables and sustainable energy sources, you know, and and where does nuclear sit in that? I know that's an entire conversation probably that we could have all day, but but just in in a, in summary, you know, what do you think really we should be doing or should be asking government to do now about uh, resources? I have very strong views on this. So um, I'm, actually, I'm not going to apologise for them because this is no. This please, is my view please don't apologise. <laughs> okay, so cover off the nuclear thing first. Now, I, I am a I am a fan of nuclear. I understand there's a problem with nuclear waste. I totally understand that. But as a base load provider, nuclear is a very good zero emission uh, way of producing our electricity. If you then layer that up with um, the wind and the solar that we have now uh, and energy storage as well, which is extremely important to balance uh, when the wind is blowing and when it's not blowing. I think that could be a very good mix. I'm not a complete expert on power, but that's my view. So when it comes to the government, right, I think they are making the right noises. They are putting legislation in place. They're talking the right way about legislation. They've obviously it had the uh, RHI, which is now coming to an end, as I said. So they are willing to put money into these schemes. Um, the problem is that um, gas is far too cheap. And that, I think, is the biggest barrier to people going across to renewables because at the moment, gas is probably about three, three and a half pence a kilowatt hour. That is very, very cheap when you compare it to electricity, which is about 15, 16, 17 pence a kilowatt hour. If you want to go for electrification of heat, which the government talk about all the time and the CCC obviously want to do and we we in the industry want to do as well, we think it's the best thing. Um, you can't then have your bills going through the roof. It's not attractive to customers, but it's going to cost you more. No, people are not going to do that. But gas is artificially cheap. I think it's the case that in the in the Europe, the, U- the UK are the worst for the spark gap, which is the difference between the gas and electricity prices. Right. In other European countries, they are closer together. Um, so electric, electric heating, such as heat pumps, um, is a lot more comparable with running a gas boiler. So until the government address that issue of gas not being cheap anymore, artificially cheap and being subsidised, we are not going to make the inroads that we need to achieve what they're talking about, which is electrification of heat and essentially zero carbon. Because if you've got very low carbon electricity generation, it makes sense to then use that for heating as well as everything else. Yeah, right. um, heat pumps can be used for um, energy storage as well. So they can be he- they can be helping to balance the grid. They can be helping to balance out when the wind blows and when the sun shines. You can use heat pumps in that way for demand response. Um, but until they address the gas issue, it's it's going to still be, I still think it's still going to be niche and um, the government have to eventually start using a stick. They're going to have to start telling people. We've seen it with COVID. They managed to change the UK almost overnight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> so if we have a climate emergency, which is actually could damage and kill more people than COVID could, in the long run, this is worldwide, um, they should be able to um, do drastic measures and and basically force people to act a certain way. I don't know if any government would actually do that, but if they don't do that and they don't change the gas price in 10 years, we could still well be in this same situation and still talking about an apparent climate emergency, which isn't because nobody's really doing anything about it. Thank you, Laura. I think I think that's uh, that's an excellent point to make, Kerry. Just to to round up, then um, you know, do we as an institution are we are we driving government enough? Do you think to to look at sustainable energy goals and particularly strategies around buildings? Uh, and and do you think that that government could be doing more? Yeah, I uh, well, I, I think government um, say could be doing more. There's some really hot topics at the moment, and uh, there are moves put to to try to join up, for example, the response um, needed to reinvigorate the economy with responding to the climate emergency, both in terms of um, you know the retrofit industry and, and and such like, but also I think the the energy um, sector as well. Those things need to be captured a bit, and uh, and, and they are being by various. Um, 
groups and think tanks and organisations that are trying to put forward to government the way that those things uh, fit could fit together. So what we're seeing from government at the moment is a lot of green talk about the green re- recovery um, after COVID and even during COVID, but the green recovery of the economy. economy. But at the same time, we're seeing various, um, uh, almost like not quite knee-jerk, but sort of uh, shovel-ready projects uh, coming forward that that are going to be supported through um, pro- uh, funding programs from the government to get construction happening. Uh, but, you know, to some extent, those are not as joined up as they should be with making sure those construction projects are as as sustainable. They are really um, you know, future fit. They have taken into account energy um, efficiency, but also energy generation or whatever. And though, so I think joining those up, that we know we have a we have a a, a role as an institution and as in, individually as engineers to try to. Uh, get in to do that. And that's one of those things I'm doing through the local enterprise partnership, for example, that, that happens at a local level to try and absolutely make sure that, that you know, whenever decisions are made about uh, funding and construction projects and, and, and the like and, and any kind of economic stimulus, that actually it runs through with, with this um, a, a energy and net zero challenge as well. And then the other point I would just make is about the whole hydrogen thing because i think hydrogen is a is a, a huge and um uh, you know uh, active topic and we, and we can and should engage more in that decisions have not been made my view uh, again a personal view um is that um hydrogen has a great potential if it's generated through renewable sources um to be a a source of high temperature heat for process industries um, it can also contribute very much to um, to transport uh, for uh, HGVs um, uh, trains such like so I think there is a role for hydrogen not in necessarily in delivering either blended or replacement gas um, it, to domestic to domestic end customers because I really don't think that is a sensible use we shouldn't need to have heat generated from hydrogen or from gas in in homes. So I would absolutely think that that what one of the things that should happen and I hope will happen is that the gas sector will switch over to hydrogen and that the majority of that hydrogen will be used for um, industrial and transport uses. So that's my hope. Kerry, I I think that's a a really nice future thought to finish on, actually. Thank you so much for being our first guest uh, on uh, Impulse to Innovation. We could talk about this all day, right? (laughs) I mean, this is (laughs) this is a subject that we might have to have its very own show for, I think. Um, But thank you so much for taking part. And um, I hope it's been of interest to our listeners. Uh, So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for bringing us on. Thank 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 you. The nature of local energy supply is changing fast. Instead of single technology projects that generate heat and or electricity, we're now seeing more joined up schemes that might involve energy storage or smart demand management, for example. On the 26th of February 2019, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers hosted a workshop on the topic of sustainable energy and community renewable projects or CRPs. Organised by the Institution's Renewable Power Committee with assistance from the Engineering Policy Unit and the Energy, Environment and Sustainability Group, the event brought together 40 delegates from across the engineering sector. They included developers, network operators, civil servants and energy policy professionals. A series of questions was posed to the group, covering the advantages of community renewable projects, the initial steps and barriers to consider when setting up a CRP, what role the private sector could play in realising the opportunities of community renewable projects and what financing and business mechanisms have been used to enable CRP development. And most importantly, what government policies needed to be in place to enable CRP to happen. In September last year, the institution published a report on the findings from the meeting. So, nearly 12 months on from the publication, has the idea of community renewable projects caught on? 
Is there any sign of engagement from government, for example? And what are the institutions engineers doing to drive this innovation in sustainable energy forward? I caught up with engineer Carly Nettleford, one of the IMEC's policy officers, to find out more. So, Carly, I guess the first question has to be, um, has the UK made any progress in decarbonising its power sector since the report was written? Um, And has government engaged with the recommendations that the institution put forward? There has been some progress made um, within local communities. um, And according to the Mayor of London section on the London Gov website. There is a London Community Energy Fund. So with that fund, they've funded 17 community energy projects. So they were awarded a total of £188,000, which is a great start. But I do think local communities need to do more to push for more government engagement. Yeah, sounds sounds like they could definitely do with some more money on that as well. Are there any are there any really good examples of companies that have really engaged or are making a success of uh, small scale local energy projects? You know, uh, what what are uh, the what are these communities doing with this money that you've uh, mentioned? One thing that was mentioned in the report was the smart export guarantee, um, and that policy has actually begun. And different energy companies have set their own tariffs. So a small number of them are seen as smart tariffs. And that's due to them varying by the time of day. A great example of this would be Octopus Energy, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. And they have a tariff called Agile Octopus. And there are many benefits of this tariff. So it's great if you have, for example, an electric vehicle or storage heaters in, and it that in itself is an incentive to obviously get electric vehicles. It also gives you the option to shift electricity usage outside of the four to seven peak time. So that gives you an extra saving. And the prices are updated daily in relation to wholesale prices. So if, for example, there's a drop in a wholesale price, your bill will be reflected with that drop. And a lot of people are concerned about um, if there's a a rise in the wholesale price, but this tariff caps the amount that you pay. So you won't pay more than 35 pence per kilowatt. So it's a really good incentive for people who are looking to engage in smart scale energy projects, do things within their own house. Yeah, that sounds like a really good way of of ensuring that that people use their energy more effectively and more wisely, but also make sure that they're not overspending, which sounds like a really sensible way to use energy. (laughs) Absolutely. And um, they also have something called plunge pricing. So when more energy is created than consumed, the price is full. And this is the world's first option to do this. So it gives consumers an opportunity to take an advantage of negative price events and get paid for the electricity you're actually using. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good way to encourage people to use uh, or to in, uh, install solar power systems or energy storage systems. Uh, and I know that's that's something that, as we, as you rightly said, as we see more cars, electric vehicles on the road, people are going to want to be able to store that energy and then use it for other things uh, at different times. So it sounds sounds like a really good scheme. Yeah, I think it's all. Um a positive push in the right direction for where we should be going. Yeah. Is there much research being done on CRPs? Are there any projects going on that sort of outside of the local communities to to develop these sort of programmes? Yeah. So um, within the report, it suggested that there should be universities used as testbeds. There are several universities that have been conscious enough to turn their universities into testbeds. So for example, In Scotland, St Andrews University has received funding from the government to build an energy centre on their campus and are striving to be the UK's first energy carbon neutral university. Yeah, like um, Kingston University have also stated that they're committed to reducing its CO2 emissions by 35% by the end of this year. Wow. Um, And the university holds an 
its own energy and water policy signed by the vice chancellor and the pro vice chancellor. So they've been doing quite a bit um, in terms of renovating their building and they have incorporated renewable energy technology into their new buildings and refurbishments, making it a long term priority to be as efficient as possible. So these are just two examples of universities that have been doing a lot of research into CRPs, but there are so many universities that are following their lead. Yeah, it sounds like they're setting really good examples by becoming their own technical demonstrators, in fact, and 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 demonstrating that it is possible to, to perhaps take, I mean, in St. Andrew's case, they've got some very old buildings, um, you know, to take some of those buildings and and, uh, and make them into energy efficient uh, facilities. So that sounds like a really good example of, uh, of what's going on in, in research. Yeah, it's really great. And it's also important to um, engage with young people and get them involved in these kinds of projects. So it's really good to hear. Well, that that's a really good lead into another question I have for you, actually, about, uh, you know, is community energy... Uh, it's obviously all about local people uh, and what they can do to manage their own energy use in their communities. So I guess if we've got listeners who are involved in uh, in these sort of projects, in these CRP projects, um, it'd be really interesting to hear from them, I suppose, and, and to find out a little bit more about uh, what initiatives they're taking and what, what things are available for local people, local communities to be able to uh, put these projects together. Yeah, so there are quite a few initiatives available for locals to get involved in. It was researched while doing the report um, that there are uh, community trusts, foundations, housing associations and different partnerships and even down to individual people who who have been made aware of new technology. They use something called peer-to-peer electricity trading, which allows their neighbours to buy and sell electricity from them. So people are taking it upon themselves to be more energy conscious. And alternatively, if um, you have a look on the London Gov website, there are many volunteering opportunities to get involved in energy projects that are happening around London. All right. Okay. So we'll, we'll put a link to that in the, in the podcast notes, but um, also I'd, I'd be really interested to know from some of our international listeners as, as to whether or not they're implementing these sorts of projects as well. So we'd be really interested to hear from, from them. Um, so that's great. Well, Carly, I guess my final question really is going to be, it, you know, this seems to have been driven very much by people themselves. But is government doing anything to to make changes? You know, are we seeing any shift in uh, in the government, particularly in the UK, towards these sorts of schemes and uh, whether or not they're uh, putting money more money into them? Well, from just looking and researching into what governments are actually doing to help these kinds of schemes. I could see, obviously, the London Community Energy Fund, which, as I said earlier, was a total of £188,000, which isn't really a lot to spread amongst 17 different projects. And again, that's only in London. Um, So I think there needs to be much more of a push in and outside of London to get more government engagement. We are making more changes to get towards net zero, but I think there needs to be more of a push so we can encourage people in their local communities and educate everybody just to be more conscious and see what we can do. Carly, I think that's a really great place to stop. But um, thank you ever so much for for filling us in on what's been going on both uh, in the UK and what potentially could be happening globally as well. I I think uh, this is a topic that we're going to hear a lot more about over the coming months. And I think uh, there's some opportunities to hear back from both the IMECI members who are listening today and uh, and also people outside of uh, the institution who uh, are involved in these sorts of projects to let us know uh, what uh, what they're doing. So if you want to get in touch, it's podcast at imeki.org. That's all for this month's episode. Next month, we will be looking at engineering solutions in healthcare how medical technology is changing the way we live and save lives, and the impact healthcare engineers are having in hospitals. My guest will be healthcare science advisor Jo Young from Health Education England, who will be sharing her thoughts on the workforce pipeline, technology adoption in the NHS, 
and apprenticeships in clinical engineering. We will also be reviewing the latest healthcare policy statements from the IMACE. So join me, Dr. Helen Mees, on the 7th of September for episode two of Impulse to Innovation, Engineering Solutions in Healthcare. You've been listening to Impulse to Innovation, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to share any news or any feedback with us, then please email us, podcast at imeke.org. All the information on this episode can be found in the episode notes.